Do you like to wait? I'm going to wait. For, no. <laughs> I've lived in several larger cities like Charlotte and Atlanta. and all those places, the traffic was often heavy. Driving anywhere at certain times of the day meant spending a lot of time waiting in stoplights or in stopped traffic. And I guess we get used to it in some degree or another. I learned to uh, strategize. I would either go to work earlier or later, or I'd find a different way that was often longer and took longer, but at least I wasn't waiting. I'm not a fan of waiting. <laughs> you know, when fast food first came into being, the advantage was that you didn't have to wait. You go in and you order a hamburger or whatever, and within a minute the food was in your hands, and it wasn't healthy food, but it was quick food. And we got accustomed to that, and so when I go to a fast food place now and I have to wait for five minutes, because now they serve more than hamburgers, they have this big variety of stuff, and they make these special drinks, and sometimes the person in front of you wants everything. And I get impatient. I want fast food. I don't want to wait. Do you like to wait? In last week's text about Jesus being led into the wilderness by the Spirit, here was Jesus, he had been called, he had been baptized, he had been affirmed by the heavens. He's all ready to go to do good, to heal the sick, to feed the hungry. And the Spirit leads him to a place where he has to wait for a long time. And there to endure temptation before he is ready to do what he does. What was it that he needed in this time of waiting that he didn't already have. And now we have Abram and Sarah waiting still. They've been called to leave their home, their familiar way of life. They have done this. They've traveled and found this land that God had in mind for them. The promise of that part has been fulfilled, but God had also very clearly said that they would have a child that they could give this land to someday. If you know the story, you know that they had waited and they were old. And then today's text, God comes to Abram in a vision and says what Abraham has already been told. There's no new information in this. You've been faithful to the promise, Abraham. Your reward is going to be great. You will have a child, and Abraham interrupts, but I don't have a child, God. Are you still sticking to this old plan you have? And God listens and doesn't seem to get upset with Abraham's interruption. And God says, well, come outside with me and look up at the sky and count the stars. And that's how many descendants you're going to have. And if I had been Abraham, I would have been a little tired of waiting. And I might have just blurted out, yeah, really, God? How long are you going to keep telling this story? I mean, this is a story that takes a little magic to make it happen. But Abram didn't say that. Maybe all that waiting had changed him some. Maybe he was beginning to understand who God is and how God does things. Maybe the only way to understand some things is to wait and then wait some more while everyone else around you is listening to you tell this story about what you're waiting for and they're probably saying really i think this story about abram and sarah and the story that we explored last week about jesus in the wilderness are alpha stories for us you know, when we introduce ourselves to new people that we're just meeting, we tell them our name and where we've come from. We, we tell them maybe what we do for a living and where we've lived in other places. We tell a brief part of our personal story so they can have some sense of who we are. And it's the same in these sacred stories. And let's remember that these stories are, are theological storytelling more than history. We have a story tells us what it means to follow God's call. It's a lot about waiting. 
It's a spiritual narrative. These were our ancestors in faith. They are part of our alpha story, meaning they are part of what explains who we are as a people of faith. And in both of these stories, there's this season of waiting, and that runs throughout the biblical narrative. And, you know, people say there are good things that come to those who wait. And that's really nice when you have finished waiting. But most of us don't want to hear that when we are waiting. Because we live in a society where we expect things now. We, we want it quick. We want everything to be like fast food. We want it to be like sound bites. Don't give it to me in a paragraph. Give it to me in a sentence. Don't tell me a story, just tell me what the point is. And that's pretty hard. I know the world has changed a lot since these old stories were first told. Nothing much happened very quickly back then. But I do want to suggest there is something in this story that cannot be grasped without taking time to slow down and to ponder, to wait. I'm not really sure there is something that we can call spiritual fast food. So I think Jesus spent time in the wilderness and endured the temptations because there was more for him to learn. He needed to practice. He needed experience with hard struggles. He was going to face a lot of that stuff in his ministry. And you don't learn that in a book. You don't pick up that ability in a soundbite. You have to sit with it, and you have to work with it, and pray with it, and you have to really want it. The disciples who were called in the storm of the sea, they call out in fear to Jesus, who is asleep in the same boat that they're in, and he says, why do you have so little faith? You see, they believed that the storm was stronger than Jesus. They had not waited long enough and endured enough yet. To understand this new thing that God was doing. You see, when God calls us, God invites us and God permits us to respond honestly. There's no coercion. Abram and Sarah struggle to figure out how to respond to this call. It makes no sense to them in the way they've been living and in their way of thinking. And so for them and maybe for us, faith is a hard-fought and deeply argued conviction. They struggle with it. They struggle with God. And God allows that. It's the way of faith. God has to often shatter our previous understandings, has to, has to disorient us so that we can begin to see something new. Paul was blinded on the Damascus Road. His old way of seeing had to be changed. So he was given a new set of lenses through which to see the world, the eyes of faith. Well, Abram and Sarah had come a long way. They had traveled. They had risked a lot. Before, they had a closed future, and God invited them to a new life. And they abandoned that closed future. They risked something new and something different. It's their faith. They don't understand that faith yet. But it's that faith that allows them to receive the gift that God is giving. Walter Brueggemann says that the ones who are barren and hopeless become the practitioners of faith. They are the ones who do not doubt the promise and so allow the new age to surge upon them. Are you barren? Do you sometimes feel hopeless? So Abram didn't say to God what I would have said. Really? Abram believed what God said and was willing to continue risking his life for that possibility. So to wait a long time is part of our spiritual story. It begins in our Alpha stories about who we are, what's involved being a pe people of God. And the stories tell us that God's sense of time is much different from yours and mine. 
And the stories remind us in the wonderful world the words of Anne Lamott. The difference between God and us is that God never thinks he or she is us. What is it you say, Albert? You'll get it later. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> we often think we know God well enough to assume what God wants to do. So we jump in instead of waiting to receive the gift. And the gift can't be forced. It comes in its own time. For everything, there is a season. But it's hard. I, I still don't like waiting better at it than I used to be. For the last year, I have lived by myself in a house that has uh, been a great place to live. Um, I chose not to have a TV, and I chose not to have internet at home. At first, it was that I'm probably only going to live here a month or two. The house I'm in has been for sale, and I figured it was going to sell, which it just did. So I am looking for a place. <laughs> and I probably will have a TV or internet. But in that time of not having a TV or internet, I realized how much I depended on that to just fill space, fill, to make noise, to, to be something to do. I've learned how to sit in the silence. I've learned sometimes to sit at night with maybe a light on or a candle or just the glow of the fireplace and to just be, to actually just sit there doing nothing with my eyes closed thinking or praying. It seems odd, perhaps, but I couldn't do this if I had children running around or if I was in a home with other people and I had other responsibilities, but this is a season of my life that has come to me. I wasn't planning for it or expecting it. And so as I go through a series of changes in my life, I'm learning how to wait. And it's hard. Sitting still is hard. But in that waiting, I have learned to read poetry over and over again until I know certain poems by heart. And I've learned to read a book or a chapter of a book and then to read it again and again so that I really take in what the author is saying. I watch some movies on my computer and then I watch them again and again because there's a lot to pay attention to. And it helps me. It helps me to deepen my spirit. It, it helps me to know my story. It helps me to have a better context for living. I, I hope it helps me to love more generously and to care more deeply. But it's all a process, always a process. It's never an end product. And that's why I encourage you, I urge you to read these stories of our faith. Over and over again. Don't trust what you heard in Sunday school as a child. But get to know the stories and explore them with others. Come, come to the Bible study on Mondays at 6. And we just come with a lot of curiosity and we learn from each other. Or start your own group. It's our story. It really is our story. I want you to know it. I want us to know it. I had the occasion last Friday to meet with somebody from Senator Kay Hagan's office. I met on the behalf of the North Carolina Council of Churches with another priest from this area, Jim Abbott, who has just retired from St. Matthias down the road. And we had three undocumented workers with us, and we were talking about immigration. And one worker brought his three-year-old daughter. Just a charming, delightful little girl. They each told their stories, and their stories were really hard to hear. The realities were painful. The hardest for me was to hear the story of this young man with his daughter. She was born here. He was a worker at Shogun when ICE raided them and arrested many of them. He had done nothing wrong, nothing illegal, except for being undocumented. Each of these three had come to this country. Their stories were different. They came from different places. But they all came because life circumstances pretty much dictated. They didn't really have a lot of choice. In many ways, it was our U.S. policies over the years that caused those circumstances. 
But this man is now scheduled to be deported soon. And it could mean that he will never see his three-year-old daughter again. The senator has not been willing to do anything to help this man. I don't know why. I don't know what she could do. But I sat there and I asked myself, what can I do? And I haven't been able to come up with an answer. I can, I can and I will work for immigration policies that are just, but it's a slow process. And I pray to God, please God, do something. Show me what to do. But I don't have any answers. And I have to live with the possibility that maybe I can't do anything to change his circumstances. Just like I can't help some people who knock on the door who are homeless or hungry or addicted. It hurts. And it may be a season in which we have to wait longer on some things and do our best to be aware of where God is moving and creating new possibility. And it means that I have to sit with a pain that is uncomfortable. Because I can't fix this. What I can do is love those who have the power to change our laws. And I can advocate for those changes. And I can stand in solidarity with those whose lives are impacted. And I can show compassion and generosity. But I have to wait and pray and seek to be available. For the season that will come when God will come to me and you with a vision of the promise moving forward. Where God's reign will come and liberate and set free. I know from our story that sometimes we have to wait a long time. And I don't like that. I want you to know that story with me. Because I want us all to know that we can trust in the God who seems sometimes to move very slowly. And I want this man, and these three undocumented workers, to know this story. Because I may not be able to change their reality, but maybe I can assure them that they're not alone. I wish we could just get to Easter, don't you? I wish we didn't have to walk this lonesome valley of faith. I wish that a lot, but what I know is this is the story, and it reminds me that God is with us in the midst of it, working, waiting with us to hear the call, waiting for us to be willing to follow, and then disorienting us so that we can begin to see with new eyes of faith, so the years after the promise has been given and we're still waiting when God comes to us again, we're not going to say, yeah, really, God? But instead, we can say with a sense of deep trust, yes, really, I'm ready, and I believe. Amen. Amen.